Hi everybody, I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot. In my last video, I gave you six tips to improve the signs on your layout with the assurance that you could achieve everything I talked about using the same word processor you'd use to make basic, I'm gonna say, boring signs. There are many reasons to make your own signs and with today's technology, it's easy to do. Even if after the last video, you're afraid to give it a try, stick around because in this video, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and show you how to do it. Now, if you haven't watched the previous video yet or you need a refresher, you might want to do that now. You can click on the link right up here to do that. Don't worry, I'll still be here when you get back. Oh, you actually watched the last video and want to keep going, all right. If you recall from last time, these were the six tips. Number one, use a different font. Number two, mix and match. Number three, use different sizes of text. Number four, use color. Number five, use a logo. And number six, don't get in a rut. So today we're gonna to start at the beginning with font choice and work our way through the list, jumping around just a little bit, but mostly keeping that order. We're going to start with fonts, but first I want to start by putting in a one by one table. If I'm actually going to use Word, I like to use a table so that I get a built in border around the sign, but you don't have to. In fact, using a table can make certain things more difficult, as we'll see in a little while. We're going to start by building a version of the Darlington Electronic Instruments sign from the last video. I'll type that in with a blank paragraph above and one below, and then I'm going to center that. I'm then going to copy that into two additional cells and quickly do some font changes. You notice in the first cell it's using Calibri font as that's the default that I have set for Word on my computer. I'll change the second one to Arial and the third one I'll change to Times New Roman. Sitting here on the screen together, they don't look so bad, but if we look at them individually, you can see that if these alone were going to be your signs, it's just not very exciting. And as I mentioned in the first video, companies don't tend to use these fonts for that very reason. So I'm going to pick some new fonts. I'm gonna select the Darlington text and when I select the font box above, you'll notice that as I go scroll through and select font names in the list, that the highlighted text, in this case, the word Darlington, changes to reflect the font that's currently chosen in the list. Note that Word will not apply that font to the highlighted text until you actually click on it or press the Enter key. So for now, it's just a preview. When I did my examples for Darlington in the last video, I chose the font Geometric 231 Heavy Bold, but that's a font that I added to my system myself. So for today, I wanna to show you how to use one that should be on your computer already. Gil Sands seems to be a close match. Then I'll select Electronic Instruments, and we're going to put that in Amasis MT Pro, which is another font that comes with the operating system. And let's put Electronic Instruments on its own line. That will call more attention to the word Darlington and provide a little bit more visual interest to the sign itself. If we select Darlington one more time, I'm gonna change the font size. I could pick a specific size, but that can be tedious. So instead, I use these two buttons to quickly change the font size up and down. So I'm gonna increase the font size on Darlington. As an aside, I mentioned in the previous video about cases as well. Here we can change electronic instruments to just initial caps, and you can see how it looks that it just looks a little less formal. You might like that or you might not, but I prefer the all caps look, so that's what we'll go with. I'm gonna go back to that and play with the size until I get something I like. Let's try to make the lines the same width so when going back and forth, you can see here that 16 is too small and 18 is too big. So I'm gonna go with 17 and that pretty much aligns the sides so that it appears justified, even though I didn't select justified as my alignment. Justified just means that the words fill the width. There's a setting for that, but for our purposes here, you probably don't wanna use that. Just for some variety, I'm also going to create a sign for another fictional industry, the Lucky Leprechaun Brewing Company. Now we centered the words for Darlington Electronic Instruments, but I'm planning on doing something a little different for the brewing company, so I'm going to right align the Lucky Leprechaun Brewing Company text. I'm also gonna put Brewing Company on a separate line below Lucky Leprechaun. Now we're starting again with a pretty basic font. It just doesn't give the feel that I'm looking for, 
doesn't really provide any kind of nuance or identity to the sign. So I'm going to look through here and see if I can find something that feels a little more appropriate to something with this name. Now I'm pretty sure that in here somewhere I have a more Celtic or Gaelic looking font. There it is, American UNCD. I don't know if it's really Gaelic or Celtic, but it looks the part to me. So I'll change the brewing company words so that they use that font as well. But I want Lucky Leprechaun to stand out a little bit more in this particular case. So let's highlight it, and we're going to increase the font size overall. This looks pretty good. And then I'm going to shrink down the words Brewing Company so that Lucky Leprechaun stands out a little bit more. So now we have two entirely different looking signs, and yet we've done nothing more than change the fonts and adjust the alignment a little bit. It results in two signs that, even if you just printed them in black and white the way they are now, they look completely different from each other, yet they feel like real company signs. And the time investment hasn't been more than a couple of minutes. But we can still do more. If we play with the spacing of the lines, we can change how things look just a little bit more. Here I'm trying to find the paragraph formatting selection that I know exists. And as it turns out, that isn't an available option in the right-click menu when the text is in a table. Who knew? So instead, I'll cut the text from the table cell and paste it just below the table so that I can modify the spacing between the lines. By selecting both lines and then right-clicking to get the menu and then clicking Paragraph, we get a dialog box with a number of different settings that we can use. Spacing is an important one because you can choose how much space appears before and after each paragraph. In this case, it starts with zero points above each paragraph of text and eight points below. Another important piece is the line spacing, which is the space between each line within a paragraph. Here it's already set to multiple, which means a multiple of single line spacing and a value of 1.08, which means that it's about a tenth larger than single spacing. You'll notice here that there's a small preview window. If I modify the before and after values, it will increase and decrease the spacing as appropriate, so that you can roughly see how it's going to look before you make the selection. I'm going to set both of these to zero, and we're going to change the line spacing to single, and when we click OK, you'll notice that it changes the spacing. Now I'll select the text, cut it, and paste it back into the table. Just so we can see how the borders work with the text, I'm going to adjust the width of the table. This is going to help me keep things in line while I'm changing the values so that things don't get too big or too small. Once again, I'm going to select Darlington, and let's add some color as I did in the previous video. I'm going to make this a shade of blue, just using one of the preset colors. This may not be the final shade of blue that I use, as I may go and change it so that it matches the logo that we're going to put in later. I think the blue gives it a good look, so let's adjust the size of the font so that it fits. And I actually do like the electronic instruments text being just a little bit smaller than Darlington, at least for this exercise. We're also going to change the color of the Lucky Leprechaun Brewing Company to a more eye-catching color, in this case green. Perhaps it's a bit cliche, but it works for me. So once again, we take a step back and look at our signs. What we have is two signs that not only look different because of the font, but stand out because of both the color, font sizes, and alignments that we've chosen. If you're enjoying this video, please take a second and click the like button. This will help more people to see it. Now let's talk about logos. What you can see here is that I saved the electronic meter image from the last video. Now you'll recall that I found this by googling electronic instruments logo image and selecting one of the results. I then recolored it in the paint program that comes with Windows. When we drop it in, it comes in much larger than we want, so I'm going to change the size. And I did change the text color to match the image, but if we were doing this from scratch, I would more likely select the text and use the More Colors tool to determine what the text color was, and then use that color in the paint program. But here I'm going about it a little bit backwards. So you'll notice that when I drop the image in, it's sitting above the word Darlington. Now the reason for that is that the setting for the layout options for that image is set to be in line with the text. And all that means is that Word won't let the image cover up the text and it won't let it go behind it. It's got to be on one side, above, or below the text. In order to give you the freedom to move the image around like you want, we need to be able to set the wrapping options. 
In this case, we're going to go with it in front of the text. And now I can grab it and move it over and position it on top of that O. Do a little bit of resizing just to make sure that it's perfectly the right size and a little bit of adjustment and it sits on top of the O in Darlington. Now when we print this sign, it'll look as if the O never existed and that the electronic meter is the O just as we intend. Now let's add a logo for our lucky leprechaun sign. I'm going to go to Google, which is the search engine that I use, but you can use any search engine you want and do an image search for a leprechaun. And what I want to do is make sure that I find one that has a transparent background so that when we put it in the sign, any border that might be around the image will disappear. Now we could use a background that has a white border or a colored border, but it just makes it more difficult to make sure that the background colors match between the words and the image. So as we look through here, we can pick any one of these. Now, my personal opinion is that you probably want to stay away from things that are notoriously popular or recognizable, like the Fighting Irish logo, for example, just for the sake of realism. When you look through, you can usually tell by these checkerboard patterns that are shown with the image that is indeed a transparent background. But you'll notice that if I just click on it and right click and then choose copy image, that when I paste it in, the checkerboard background shows up. That's not what we want. Now, sometimes this will work and the checkerboard won't come in, but other times it won't. So what I need to do in this case is actually download the image to my computer and then drag that into Word. Instead of right clicking and copying, you can click on the link and go to the site. This image happens to be free, so we're in luck. I click on download and it'll let me save the image. So for now, I'll save it to the desktop and now I can drag it into Word. Now, when I drag it in, it looks like everything's disappeared, which would be bad. But in reality, the image is just really large. So Word's pushed it down to a second page. So if we scroll down, there it is. When I do, you can see that there's no checkerboard in the background of the image. So mission accomplished. I can now select the image and resize it by grabbing the circle in the corners and dragging. This allows me to shrink the image down to the size that I want. I'm also going to select the text wrapping selection. Again, I'm going to experiment by clicking on a few here to get the one I want. And this one sets it so that it won't sit on top of the text. So I just resize that image just a little bit more and then move it around to where I want it to be. Now for my taste, the logo is still a little bit too far away from the words. So I'm going to play with the layout just a little more. If I right click and choose size and position, That'll bring up another dialog box where I can change the wrapping style again, but it also gives me the options for the distance from the text. I'm going to set that to zero. Yeah, but now it looks a little too close to me. So let's go back to text wrapping and we're going to split the difference and choose 0 0.06, which is roughly half of the 0.13 that was there. And that looks pretty good to me. Both of our signs now have logos and you can see I didn't have to draw a single thing. Now, one warning, the images that you find on Google may be copyrighted and it's okay to use a copyrighted image for personal use, but you should never distribute them. Even making signs for someone else and receiving no payment for it is technically a breach of copyright law. So take that into consideration. So at this point we have two signs and we've used all of the six tips. We've used a different font than what the program gives us when you start up. We mixed and matched fonts as well as mixing and matching font types. That is the word Darlington uses a sans serif bold font while the words electronic instruments use a serif font. We've also used different text sizes with Darlington being much larger than electronic instruments and Lucky Leprechaun being somewhat larger than the words brewing company. We've also mixed things up in terms of the alignment. The Darlington sign is center aligned and the Lucky Leprechaun sign is aligned to the right. We also added color using blue for Darlington and a possibly stereotypical green for the Lucky Leprechaun. We used the logo in both cases and the best part is that we didn't have to draw anything. We ended up with an electronic instrument looking bit for Darlington and a happy-go-lucky Leprechaun for the second sign. And finally, I made sure not to get in a rut. Even though we use the same techniques to make both signs, they look completely different and even if they were shown together on the layout, it would be obvious that they belong to two different industries with individual identities. 
Both of those were pretty easy to create in Word just because of the way they came together. But let's take a look at this sign, which I showed in the last video. This is for Chex Finer Foods, which is a, a business in my local area. You'll notice that the C in Chex is much larger than the rest of the text, so how would you go about building this in a word processor? Well, I'm going to show you how. This is a little more advanced, but once you've done it once or twice, it's really not that complicated. But first, let's talk about finding fonts. The font that's used for the check sign is not a common one, and it's not one you're likely to find on your computer as is. Some fonts are easy to find using your search engine. So for example, if you wanted to find out what font was used, say, in the Chipotle logo, you could simply Google, what font does Chipotle use? It's likely going to come up with something you can check out. Now the first result here is Chipotle Mexican Grill font. We click on that and it gives me the idea of what it is and shows the logo. And this page tells us that the font that they use is Gotham Bold. You can now search Gotham Bold font and the results take you to FontGeek, which is a pretty common site for getting fonts. And it turns out that this font is actually free, so you can just download it and use it. That said, Chipotle is a big enough and well-known enough brand that there's a pretty good chance that that search was going to work. In the case of Chex Finer Foods, which is a much more niche brand, such a search is unlikely to bear fruit, but there's still hope. There's a website out there called What the Font That Can Help. What did you think I was going to say? I'll put in a link in the description and in the corner above. Now, when you go to the What the Font site, you can upload an image and it will help you to determine what fonts are in that image. You can see here that if I import the photo of the checks sign, the site shows the image and highlights the areas that it believes has text in it. Now you can make adjustments to those areas if you need to. You then click the button and it'll do some processing and find fonts that it believes to be a close match to the selected text. You can see here that the first font it found, Charlemagne Bold, is a pretty good match for the Chex Finer Foods font, but you can also see that they want you to pay $29 for it. It's probably not worth it for a single sign on your layout, but even so, there's still a way around this. Let's do another search for Charlemagne Bold Font Free, and you'll get a list of substitute fonts that you can use without having to pay. Now you can see here that this substitute font is also called Charlemagne Bold Regular, and it's also a good match for the sign. So we can download this font and install it on your computer, with no fee. Now, if you don't know how to install fonts, I'll put a bonus video for free on my Patreon page. You can check it out there. You can also support me there for as little as $2 per month, and you'll have access to extra goodies, including signs that you can print and use for your own layout. Now we go back to Word and create a new document so that we can build this new check sign. Because of the unusual layout of this sign, I'm going to employ some visual trickery so that we end up with a reasonable representation. Now the first thing I'm going to do is create a table that is two columns wide by three rows deep. Now why am I doing this? Let's look at the original sign one more time. I'm going to break the sign up into four distinct elements. Number one is the large C. Number two is the HEX portion of checks. Number three is the since 1965 tagline. And finally, number four is the finer foods portion of the title. If we take a step back and look at how these are laid out, they fall into two columns. You can see that the capital C is in one column, and the rest of the text is in column two. Because of that, a two-column table makes sense for this sign. Additionally, the items in column two break into three distinct rows. So with this information in hand, I create a table that is two columns wide by three rows deep. I'm going to select the whole table and change my font for the whole thing to Charlemagne Standard so that we don't have to worry about it later. And in the top row of column one, I'm going to put in the lone letter C. In row one of column two, I will put in the capital H-E-X text. Now I'm going to skip down to the third row to put in the finer foods piece because row two is actually going to be the one that's a bit of a challenge. In the second row, I'll put in the since 1965 piece, but you'll notice the sign uses stylized lines on each side of that text. So to replicate this, I'm going to use the M dash symbol, which is just a fancy term for a very long dash. To do this, you go into the insert menu and choose symbol, and then choose more symbols. In the dialog box that comes up, scroll down until you find what looks like a really long dash and click on it. The Unicode name will tell you if you have the right one. Now I can insert that and then put the since 1965 lettering in there as well, followed by another M dash. 
So to make the letter C appear correctly, we're going to need to make Word think that column one only has one row. Now the way that you do that is to merge the cells, and you can do this by selecting the cells you want, then right-clicking and selecting the Merge Cells option. This will make it look like there's only one cell over there. Now we can select our C, right justify it. Now based on the image, the finer foods text is going to be the gating factor for the second column. So I shrink down the width of the table to match finer foods. And now I'm going to select the HEX and increase the size of that until it fills the cell. So now I'm going to try and change the since 1965 text, which I've mistyped as since 1968, but I'll fix that later. One of the things that Word does that drives me nuts is that it tries to, quote, help you at the most inopportune times. What it's done here is turned this line into a bulleted line so that the M dash is the bullet there. It uses the M dash as the bullet character. So I need to go in and turn that off. So I select the line go up to the bullets and change it to none, and then fix the dash. It may be hard to tell, but the font used for since 1965 is not the Charlemagne font, so I want to change it. I'm going to select that text, and I'm just going to go look for something that will be a reasonable stand in here. To do that, I'm going to go through the same process of selecting the text and then just scrolling through the fonts until I find something that feels right. This one seems like a good fit, so I'll pick that. And now we're going to center it, since it's centered on the sign. And then finally change the size so it looks right. Now we've got to do something about that capital C and make it fill the rest of the sign. So I'm going to select that and increase the size until it fills the space. Now you can try and play with the spacing in the cells as I did here, but it really depends on how exact of a match you want to make it. What I ended up doing was changing the placement of the AGX text, which really didn't help much, honestly, and then changing the cell spacing on the C to remove the space to the right of the letter. All this is found by right-clicking, choosing Table Properties, and removing the space to the right. And you can see that it moved the C closer to the dividing line at the center of the table. Now the sign doesn't have any lines in between those sections of texts, and the table does, so how do we take care of that? Well, I'm going to select the whole table again by clicking on the crosshairs over here at the upper left. And then you can click on this button, which is the borders selection, and choose borders and shading. And what we're going to do is remove the lines inside the box by clicking here and clicking here and then clicking OK. Now you can see that the lines inside are going to disappear, but the outside borders stay where they were. Now on the screen, they haven't gone away completely, but they do appear dashed. And that's how Word lets you know that there are still cells here. But if we go to Print Preview and increase the size just a little bit so that it's easier to see, you can tell that the lines won't appear between the letters when you print. Now you can continue to play with the size and spacing as long as you want so that it's a good fit. And then you can print this and use it on your layout. Using a technique like this allows you to create more complicated signs without having to resort to using a graphics program if you don't want to learn one. Now I will say that this would be a much easier job to do in a graphics program like Corel Draw, where individual items can be created and moved around independently. But there's a learning curve to that, and I know that a lot of people don't want the expense of another program and don't want to worry about having to learn a new program. So if you're intent on sticking with the word processor, this shows you that you still have options when it comes to some more complicated sign layouts. Finally, I want to talk about fonts and era. Certain fonts are popular during certain periods and then fall out of favor, and new fonts are being created all the time, so you have to make sure that the one you're using fits your time period. For example, most modelers are familiar with Tony Custer's former Allegheny Midland layout. The font that he used for the logo when he was modeling the 80s anyway is called Avant-Garde. Tony himself has noted that in that time period when the logo was supposed to have been created, the Avant-Garde font did not yet exist. So it makes sense to do some research when it comes to fonts and appropriate time periods. An easy way to do this is to do yet another search or two. If you search for things like popular fonts of the 1960s, you're going to get a site like Fonts in Use to come up, and that site is going to give you some information on what fonts were popular in that time frame. I'm going to put a link to Fonts in Use site down in the description, or you can click up in the upper corner. 
Now another option is to search for the name of the font itself with the word history attached. Most of the time you'll be able to get information on the font, including when it was created. As you can see here, Arial, the font that modelers often default to for signage, wasn't designed until 1982. So in addition to being overused and boring, it's also not appropriate for any layout set before that year. By doing a little bit of research, you can understand what fonts make sense for your models. Another quick piece that was recently mentioned in a comment revolves around wording and abbreviations as they relate to your era. The comment says this, you can indicate the era of a sign by selecting the wording and abbreviations carefully. For example, in the first half of the 20th century, and even earlier, it was common to abbreviate James as J-A-S, Joseph as J-O-S, Brothers as B-R-O-S, Charles as C-H-A-S, and so on. Small businesses were rarely incorporated, so and company was much more common then than Inc. is now, and LLC was nearly unheard of. A good source for company names is old city directories from the era you're modeling. Thanks to R. Wispbaum for bringing up those very valid points. So this video has showed you how to use your basic word processor to implement my list of six tips to improve your layout signs. And I hope that these help you to create some masterpieces for your layout. I'd love to hear about your sign making experiences, good and bad, in the comments below. And as always, that's also the place for questions and suggestions. Just a reminder to subscribe to the channel. I cover all things model railroading here, so it'd be great if you could come back. Also click on the bell so you'll get notified when new content is available. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Links are in the description below. For more great content, you can also check out these links over here. I'm Joe Parker of the Pixel Depot. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll meet me next time in the train room.